Welcome to Tea Time with the Jackson Center. I am Kristen McMahon, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. We envision a world where the universal principles of equality, fairness, and justice prevail. 2021 is an important recognition year for Justice Jackson, international humanitarian law, and the Jackson Center itself. And during the course of this year, we have been celebrating the 80th anniversary of Justice Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court, the completion of the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials and the birth of international humanitarian law, and the 20th anniversary of the Robert H. Jackson Center. And all of those milestones naturally had us looking back to see how far we, the law and the world have come. But we know we cannot simply rest on our laurels so it also sparked conversations regarding where are we going and how do we get there? And that is part of the story of how we got to our programming theme for 2021, the work left to do. During this year, we are convening conversations about democracy, US and global institutions, human rights and equity. We have structured our teas a little bit differently this year. Each month has a particular focus and in November, we are looking at immigration and refugee justice. The first T each month uh, is geared to provide you with an understanding of the work left to do to achieve equity or to make progress in this area. And the second T each month, which this is, is geared to show you, showcase those actively doing the work to close those gaps. We hope each of these programs inspires you to have conversations with your family, friends, and colleagues and to seek out ways to make change in your own communities. So today I am excited to be in conversation with Steve Roth, the executor, the executive director of ORAM, the Organization for Refuge, Asylum and Migration. ORAM is recognized as one of the first international non-governmental organizations to assist people fleeing persecution based on their sexual orientation and or gender identity and expression and has, it has become a thought leader in LGBTIQ migration. Founded in 2008, ORAM has trained governments, uh, UNHCR, the UN's refu refugee agency, and other NGOs on the unique needs of LGBTIQ refugee population. Steve, thank you so very much for being with us today. Awesome, thank you so much, Kristen. It's great to be here. So I like to start each of these conversations with what I call basically an orientation question. And so to get a sense from you of when we're talking about justice as it applies to uh, immigration, immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, what does that mean to you? Uh, sure, well, that's a great question uh, to start with. And thank you again uh, to you and the Jackson Center for having us here for Tea Time, really excited. And um, you know, the, the, this question is so uh, timely, I think, especially as immigration and refugee issues are so much in the news today. And it's, um, you know, it's definitely part of our, our, I think, a daily conversation for a lot of people. And also, I would say just such a good tie into your theme of the work left to do uh, in order to achieve equality, fairness, and justice uh, for all, because there's certainly a lot of work to do. Um, but in terms of what uh, immigration and refugee justice means uh, for us, for me, and for, for the organization, um, really it goes back to um, the fact that, that people have the right to access fair and free asylum. Um, this was something that was established under the United Nations uh, 1951 Refugee Convention, also known as the G Geneva Convention. And um, you know, what, this, uh, what this provision stated is that those who face uh, persecution and flee their home country uh, are able to seek asylum if they have a, a well-founded fear of returning um, to, to their home country. Um, and then there are specific cat uh, categories for persecution, um, which must, which is based on either race, religion, nationality, uh, political beef, belief, or being a member of a particular particular social group. And um, it has been determined that being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer is uh, considered member uh, member of a uh, particular social group under the definition of um, the Geneva Convention and um, the subsequent 1967 protocols. So um, so the you, talking about immigration refugee justice, it means being able to access that right to free and fair asylum. Um, there are currently around 70 countries globally that criminalize LGBTQ people in some way, whether it's same-sex relations or transgender status. Um, it's even punishable by death in nearly 10 countries. Um, so there's a 
And, and beyond that, there are many more countries uh, that, that people know of, like Russia, for example, that while technically not criminalizing uh, LGBT people per se, are still very, very hostile um, to, to people in this group. And um, so, you know, there's it's, there's a real essential um, need for people to access these services. There, I think it's important also just to define the difference a little bit between an asylum seeker and a refugee. Um, a refugee is uh, is someone who's been forced to flee their country of origin and has been recognized uh, as a refugee by a government body like the UNHCR or um, um, the government of a resettlement country. Um, they're recognized as having a well-founded fe founded fear of persecution. An asylum seeker is um, someone who has left their country of origin and is currently in the process of applying to stay in a country of residence. And then once their application is approved, they're, um, they're then referred to as an asylee. So there's just a, a slight difference. And, um, and then asylum seekers and refugees are different still from um, just other forms of immigration more broadly. Um, you know, a lot of people immigrate for reasons um, you know, economic reasons and other reasons, but um, with asylum seekers and refugees who are the folks that we work with at ORAM, it's, um, you know, it's a really a specific type of person that's fleeing persecution. They have often have special needs. Um, they're often fleeing without papers. They have to um, prove their um, kind of who they are and their, um, the persecution that they're facing. They don't always have um, the other rights that, that other migrants do. And it can honestly be a really long process that, um, that people go through. Um, and then that's, that's kind of the, the legal aspect of, um, of uh, immigrant and refugee justice. But then there's another side to it as well. And that is just that refugees and asylum seekers really have the right to live lives of dignity and an adequate standard of living and uh, lives without discrimination. And these are all rights granted under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well. Well, and we'll get to this in a little bit as well, but there's also the challenge of I'll call it the in-between space. So the the resettlement um, is the ultimate goal, but there are a lot of refugees, I would imagine specifically, who are in temporary locations or that may end up being temporary for a very long time. And so that must add another layer of complexity. Yeah, and no, you make a really good point, Kristen. And there are uh... Uh, over 80 million displaced people, um, million with an M, which is a huge number. And uh, most of those are in transit somewhere. You know, they've left their countries of origin. They have yet, have yet to reach a resettlement country like the US or Canada or, or Western Europe. And so we call we call those places where they are uh, transit countries, you know, and there are a lot of the countries that you might think of, they're often adjacent to where people are fleeing from. So Turkey is, you know, has become a prime example of a transit country for millions and millions of Syrians, but other uh, refugees and asylum seekers from throughout the Middle East who are trying to reach, in most cases, trying to reach um, a better life in Europe. Um, some of those folks have now uh, shifted to Greece, which although Greece is part of the EU is, um, is considered by many to be a transit country as well, because it's not a great place to be, especially in the, in the case of the people we work with. If you're a, you know, a, a trans woman from Iran or a, you know, a gay man from Cameroon, um, Greece is not exactly the promised land. I mean, there's still a lot of discrimination. There are language issues and other things. And closer to home, uh, Mexico, of course, has become a really big transit country because um, you have folks coming from uh, throughout Central America and as we've seen more and more recently from far beyond as well, but trying to come through Mexico to, um, to reach the US. But as we all know, many of them spend months or years or more in transit countries like Mexico. Well, and I'm going to anticipate that COVID, the COVID situation we've been living under for the last 20 months has also added yet another layer of complexity to that. So how has how has that changed or has it changed some of the, the justice uh, conversations with regard to immigrants and refugees? Yes, that's a great question. It's changed it dramatically. I mean, first, um, there's the practical level, the impact that COVID has had on movement on all of us, on all people um, that has had a ripple effect on um, refugees and asylum seekers. So most um, resettlement programs shut down entirely during um, the height of COVID. Some of them are starting to open up back slowly, but even countries that relative to their size were still welcoming um, refugees for resettlement like Canada, you know, closed their programs because of uh, the dangers of COVID. Um, 
other governments, um, and I won't get political here, but I just will state a fact, my opinion, uh, you know, I think the US included used COVID as an excuse to, um, to really block off, cut off uh, uh, resettlement and um, refugee and asylum seeking. Um, we have a policy currently still in place in the US called Title 42, which was really created um, for uh, health measures decades ago and was used by the previous administration in this country to close the, um, the US borders entirely to asylum seekers, which really um, flies in the face of UN convention, which states that, um, that all people have a right to seek asylum if um, you know, they have uh, um, persecution, incredible fear for their own safety. And um, so you know, even at the high, even when the US was uh, the global epicenter of the COVID pandemic and we had the highest case in the world, you know, we were still towing this line that we had to close our borders to keep us safe from, um, from asylum seekers that may be uh, carrying COVID. So that was, you know, there was that kind of that limitation on movement. And then there's the fact that, um, that refugees and asylum seekers, particularly, again, the folks that we work in with in the LGBTQ community who are doubly, triply, quadruply marginalized, you know, based on their sexual orientation and their gender identity, as well as their race and um, skin color and and many other things, um, kind of are at the bottom of the ladder and get pushed down in terms of uh, social services available to them. Um, a lot of them have higher uh, risk for um, you, you know dangers of COVID due to uh, conditions like HIV, um, living in places that aren't safe, living in crowded conditions. Um, so it really, uh, you know, it really has pressured the um, the refugee and asylum system uh, even more and, and even, you know, proven to be even more of a challenge to those, uh, to justice for these folks. So let's talk a little bit about ORAM and the work it does. Um, ORAM is about 13 years old, if I am remembering correctly. Correct. And so would love to know what prompted its founding. So clearly there were needs that were not being met somewhere uh, and uh, yeah. would love to hear the origin story of ORAM. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so back in 2008, when um, when ORAM was founded, there were really no organizations that were working specifically to support people um, fleeing persecution based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. And uh, so our founder, a guy named Neil Grungris, who was working in a, a mainstream uh, uh, refugee humanitarian organization called HIAS, uh, you know, he had started working more closely on these issues and decided to create a separate separate organization that would address these needs. Um, and it was at a time that um, a lot of service providers didn't even realize that LGBTQ people qualified for uh, refugee status. Um, so there was a huge need really just for education on, you know, the ability to claim asylum on sexual orientation, gender identity. There was also, as you can imagine, there still is, but even more so 13 years ago, um, so much discrimination in the system against LGBT people, whether it was at the hands of um, governments who were assessing um, people's uh, refugee status or uh, the United Nations themselves, UNHCR is the, the body that oversees refugee issues, or even um, sadly, it may come as a surprise, but, um, but truthfully, even among the international NGOs working with this population, of course, a lot of their populations were, were uh, local, uh, local staff. And so um, part of Orem's early work was to create a space for um, the needs of LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers to be recognized. So we did a lot of training, um, wrote a lot of, did a lot of research and wrote publications on, on the topics. And so that was really kind of, um, that, that's a bit of the origin story. And then just to catch it up a little bit in uh, more recent years. Um, so, you know, a lot of things have changed in 13 years. And certainly for the, um, the four years of the previous administration, uh, refugee resettlement in general, um, ground down to almost a, a, a complete standstill, even prior to, uh, to COVID, our uh, refugee resettlement under the Obama administration, we were welcoming about 100,000 refugees to the US every year. Under the Trump administration, um, it was down to about 15,000 and not even all those spaces were getting recognized. And mind you, that's out of a, a total of 80 million displaced people. So you, it's just a tiny fraction of a fraction. And um, and, and so um, we, you know, because of those changes, because of the lack of resettlement, um, we started shifting more to focus on supporting people um, where they were as well as along their journeys. Um, so still really uh, helping and focusing on resettlement and advocating for resettlement, but also recognizing that the vast, vast majority of refugees and asylum seekers, as we were uh, mentioning earlier, 
are kind of stuck in transit countries for years at a time. And so there's a huge need for services to enable people to be able to uh, live lives of, of dignity and have their needs met in those transit countries. Well, and I, if I am recalling my you know, US history correctly, although we consider ourselves a nation of immigrants, I feel as if the United States has long been challenged by immigration policies. Um, and I'm thinking back to, you know, World War II and, and earlier as well. Um, are there countries that that you might suggest as models for, for how to do this? Or, or are, there, are there countries that do it particularly well? And I'm honestly not sure what well means in this yeah. circumstance either. So if you have thoughts on that, that yeah. would be helpful too. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point. Uh, we really we are 100 percent a country of immigrants. There's no way to, to deny that anyone that would deny it would be lying. But we have this uh, in the U.S. A, a, a very checkered past. Right. I mean, we have great moments of greatness. I think we've really opened our doors to uh, to refugees, you know, around the time that, uh, you know, Justice Jackson was on the court and other periods. There's been times where we've horribly shut our doors, whether through the Chinese Exclusion Act or through, you know, later periods or, you know, um, a lot of what's happening today or has happened in recent years. Um, so it's a shame it's a mixed bag in this country. And it's I, it's honestly been the, uh, the same in other countries. I mean, we know that Germany famously opened its doors dramatically during the uh, Syrian refugee crisis a few years ago and welcomed, um, you know, over uh, uh, what would have been like over 1% of their population as refugees, um, which is pretty huge, but they've also uh, largely shut their doors right now. So I guess to answer your question in terms of kind of current role models, I would say that Canada is doing a, a good job and a balanced job. Um, particularly when it comes to LGBTQ refugees, which of course is the space that I know best. Um, Canada has a really great uh, sponsorship program so that private individuals and groups like churches or other interest groups can actually uh, sponsor uh, refugees uh, for resettlement. So it doesn't put a burden, kind of a cost burden on the country per se. It's not taxpayer funded. I, they have an allocation of those, but this allows them to expand the program in a, in, you know, in a way that the communities of interest can help can help folks. And so uh, I'm glad to say this is actually something that the US government is seriously considering and is actually, you know, we're in conversations with the State Department and we know they're working on on um, some plans and ideas around that as well, which is which is great because you know at the end of the day we're you know we're a country of amazingly generous people that that have the interest and capacity to do that. And I will say, um, you know, there, a lot of people are familiar with the the tra the tragedy and the travesty of Afghanistan right now. This happened, and various people from various groups, whether it's women or LGBT people or others, um, you know, that now under dire threat that are leaving. I think it's um, if there's anything good to come out of that, I think it's raised awareness um, in the general public for some of the, the true challenges that refugees face and really has kind of brought that home for people. Well, and you mentioned that ORAM has expanded from its roots into working with refugees and asylum seekers where they are. And so even if they are in transit countries, so I'd love to get a sense of where you all are doing work and how is it working? <laughs> Not to use work too many times in yeah. one sentence there, um, but are you, is it in partnership with governments, is it in partnership with local organizations? Um, how, how does this actually function? Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, lots of questions there. So I'll try to answer as many as I can. Remind me if I if I miss any of them. Uh, no worries. I, I try not to ask compound questions. So my apologies. Uh, no, it's good. Uh, they're all related. So uh, we do work uh, almost exclusively in transit countries. Um, uh, we have a few key focus areas right now. One is Kenya. We're doing a lot of work in Kenya. Kenya is the only country in all of Central and East Africa that accepts uh, LGBTQ refugees. Even though all countries, by you know, under UN uh, under uh, UN law, UN rule, should be accepting them, not all do. And so, you know, um, Africa is notoriously homophobic and transphobic, not universally, but many cultures there and, and nations uh, grapple with this. And it's the country, it's the continent with the most countries that, that criminalize LGBT people in some way. So, a lot of folks arriving in Kenya. Uh, you know, many people are aware that Uganda, in particular, is. Um, is extremely homophobic and transphobic and has passed laws um, recently criminalizing same-sex relations. They even were considering a, a, a notoriously named uh, kill the gays bill that would have uh, that would have instituted the death penalty for uh, for being gay. Um, that did not 
uh, get signed into law. But, uh, but yeah, so we do a lot of work in uh, in Kenya. We also uh, in the last couple of years have really uh, started working in, in Mexico, um, particularly in on the U.S. Mexico border in Chihuahua, where is you know a lot of folks have gathered, um, you know, waiting uh, crossing and. You can imagine, you know, most border towns have, are, are notorious for being dangerous um, and, and unsafe and unsavory. And, you know, particularly, again, being LGBT uh, oftentimes puts people more in the crosshairs. So we do a lot of work there. Um, we're expanding our program in Mexico now to include Mexico City as well and other points along the migration route. Um, we, historically, we did a lot of work in Turkey, um, which I'd mentioned before is a big transit country um that space is closed a lot for civil society organizations international civil society organizations especially in the area that we work in lgbt so we're not doing any direct work there uh, but we have started some pilot programs in greece um because a lot of those folks are now in greece and there's a great need there and we are also um even though uganda is a great is a big um uh, origin country for uh lgbtq refugees and asylum seekers there are also queer refugees there from other neighboring countries like um, the Congo and Rwanda and Burundi. And so we're starting some work there as well. And we do a lot, we're a very small um, virtual organization. I'm based in Los Angeles. Um, we have a couple of folks in Germany and we are starting to hire on the ground in places we work like Kenya and Mexico. Um, but part of our model is that we work extremely closely with local partners. Um, often refugee led, sometimes led by members of the local host community. Um, but these are organizations that are really, uh, that are on the ground, that are often parts of the communities that we're serving. And so we always build our work uh, with and around the people that we serve. So it's not us just kind of coming in saying, this is what you need to be doing, or this is what we're gonna do, but, um, but doing needs assessments with them and, uh, and developing programs uh, to, support, to support them. And, um, what a lot of that has has started taking the form of in Kenya in particular is what we call economic empowerment programs. So, you know, one of the realizations is that people spend extended periods of time and by extended, we mean anywhere on a on a good day. Day is the wrong word, but in the best case, you know, two to five years in the country. So that's a long time to just be twiddling your thumbs and waiting for, a you know, a letter saying you're getting resettled. And so um, these programs. Uh, and, and the biggest one of the biggest challenges, of course, for people is economic insecurity, which can lead to a lot of other problems. Um, sometimes people turn to survival sex work um, and, you know, which just creates more compounded problems. And so it's economic empowerment programs. There's also, by the way, challenges to working in the work system. Oftentimes refugees don't have permission to work in the countries where they are. And um, so by starting micro businesses, um, they're able to generate their own incomes, learn skills um, and that will prepare them, that serve them both in those jobs, but also will prepare them for wherever they go in life, whether it's staying in that country or being resettled. And um, in some cases, we're, we're starting to see this little bit in the communities where we're helping getting these programs off the ground. Um, they also give folks a chance to start rewriting um, the relationship with their host communities and people around them, because now it's not just... Um, you know, this trans woman, but it's the woman who I buy my my eggs from or, you know, uh, someone that I buy a service from. And so longer term, you know, we're hopeful that there's going to be some um, some positive impacts there, too. One of the other challenges I didn't mention, by the way, uh, when you just think through the, the myriad challenges that LGBTQ refugees face in particular is, uh, you know, folks are fleeing because it's not safe for them to be gay or bi or lesbian or trans in the, in the communities where they live. Uh, sometimes it's persecution at the hands of the police or uh, the military, but more often than not, it's actually at the hands of their own communities and their own families even. Um, so you can imagine in kind of the traditional refugee system, refugees are resettled, um, particularly in camps with um, people from their own communities, their own nationalities. So if you're, you know, if you're uh, a, a gay person from the Congo and you're fleeing, these are the people you're fleeing and then you're resettled with the Congolese community. It's like, it's kind of like you're being put back in harm's way. And so just some of the additional challenges that, um, that LGBTQ refugees face and, you know, highlighting the need why it's, you know, kind of specialized programs and services need to exist for them. It feels almost like you need to be a master chess player to be able to see the whole board and understand yeah. how these pieces need to move in order to protect someone. Um, yeah. it's a, that's a, that's an interesting challenge. You mentioned, uh, when ORAM started that part of its 
main purpose was really education and especially around educating that LGBTQ plus individuals have special needs and challenges. Are, is that work still continuing? Are there governments or maybe it's not a government in a certain area, maybe it's some other power, a community organization or something along that line that, that still need, where this education process is still happening and still needs to happen because they haven't quite gotten there? Absolutely. There's, um, there's still a huge need for it. And, um, you know, I feel like we've only scratched the surface. And there's also, you know, just on a practical level, there's a lot of turnover at the governmental level, the people that run agencies and, and organizations. So it's something that needs to, um, to be ongoing. And, you know, we've written and published a number of um, tools and guides to help with this. We have a sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression toolkit that we've distributed uh, widely to thousands of practitioners, which, um, you know, it's really just a basic uh, breakdown of like, what is the terminology? You know, what do different words mean that may be, you know, unfamiliar to the folks that work in the space? And it's translated into five languages. Um, and that's been a big tool. Um, more recently, actually, just in the last week, we published um, a, a major report that, uh, that we wrote, commissioned and wrote on the LGBT community in a Kakuma refugee camp in Northern Kenya. It's uh, one of the largest refugee camps in the world. And uh, it's got a big LGBT population and no one had ever done kind of a deep dive look at, you know, what are the needs of this particular community. And um, this report did that and uh, it came out with, you know, really um, reaffirmed a lot of the things that we knew intuitively, the challenges that, that the community faces. 88% uh, of LGBT, LGBTQ refugees in this camp had been denied police service. Um, nearly 80% had, because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, nearly 80% had been victims of attacks, physical attacks, you know, and the numbers went on and on. And um, we came out with 10 recommendations based on that as well. And so our hope and plan is to use this report as an advocacy tool to, you know, to get the, those resources in. Uh, training needs to continue to happen with the, the Kenyan government, which oversees this camp. And, um, you know, resettlement needs to be expedited for people that are particularly in danger in this community and more of those on the ground services to protect people and to empower them and to give them the, the tools they need for everyday living need to happen. So again, kind of the, the research and the advocacy, um, you know, there's still a huge need and, and, and really around the world. We've also uh, recently written two different, what we call country of origin reports um, focused on Central America. Uh, one on Honduras and the other on Guatemala. Uh, Honduras and El Salvador have the highest murder rates in the world for trans women. And so uh, a lot of those folks uh, have, fl have fled and are trying to reach the US. And when they do, um, courts uh, and justices look for, you know, for research on the countries that people came from, kind of unbiased research. And, and uh, that's what these reports serve uh, to, to support people in the court system. Yeah, that, that certainly sounds all very necessary. So you mentioned some of the economic empowerment programs, and this is a, a newer venture for, mm -hmm. for ORAM, but how long have you been working in, I think you suggested, I call them livelihoods, which mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, and, and why did you get started on, on that end of the spectrum? Sure. Um, we've been doing that for about, uh, two years. And uh, again, it was largely driven by the fact that it started under the last administration when resettlement has had really ground to a halt. And, um, you know, as I said, really to support people to develop the skills um, that they that uh, they need and, and generate incomes to support themselves um, and, you know, really break these never ending cycles of uh, dependence. And, um, you know, they're expanding and growing and they've become really popular and successes with them at the local level, which is, uh, which again, is encouraging us to bring them to other markets as well. Well, and you also mentioned earlier, and this I think is, is true for all of us, the more interaction we have with people who are different from us, the harder it becomes to see them as other. Um, and so I wonder if you are starting to see also a, a more welcoming attitude in, in the places where, where these uh, micro businesses are. And from the refugee side, are people now contemplating making what was a transit country 
their home? Like, is, is, are these getting established enough that they're just going to stay? Yeah, that's a, a, a really good question. Um, we, there, it's too early on. We don't have real data on um, kind of hearts and minds changing, you know, whether that's happening yet. We certainly hope it will lead to it longer term. It's probably honestly still a, a little early, um, but it will be interesting to see, you know, whether longer term it does impact people's uh, decisions, whether or not they want to relocate. Because uh, we've seen, ironically enough, um, some folks that have gone through the long and arduous journey to be resettled. To, and I know some uh, LGBT refugees from Africa that were resettled to Sweden that after a couple of years there I ended up returning home, you know, because life was so different and um, challenging for them in different ways. And so, you know, it is possible, I think, that these kinds of programs could um, create alternative paths or what we would like to call in this area durable solutions. Um, for people to um, to potentially stay where they where they are, you know, um, and, and or, or you know at the very least to have options, right? So, um, so so we'll we'll, we'll remain to uh, see what comes of that. Uh, one thing, one other thing that I will say that we're doing um, side by side with the livelihoods programs is also what we uh, call capacity building, which is really help uh, you know with uh, refugees and asylum seekers are are truly people on the move, and so there's this. Um, there's this constant kind of churn. A lot of the folks that, that come up and become leaders in communities often get resettled um, because of their high profile. And so then um, there's this kind of leadership churn and and um, and lack of, of organization within these very mobile communities. And so part of what we're doing is capacity building, helping within the LGBTQ refugee communities develop skills at organizing, at leadership, at you know, applying for funding, at reporting, at really tools to become um, self-sufficient and self-organized uh, so that this can actually become a, then uh, self-sustaining as well in terms of local leadership. Great, it brings to mind as well, I feel like one of the loudest arguments against uh, immigration is that uh, they become a drain on the system. And you, you touched on that a little bit earlier. And it feels like with these micro businesses and these skills that they are developing there, that argument hopefully gets harder to make um, because they are they are bringing transferable skills, if not a small business with them when, yeah. they, when they resettle. Absolutely. And there's a there's kind of a, a larger theme to tie into that too, which is that there is actually a global workforce shortage right now. And um, there are there is increasing recognition that um, that refugees more broadly are, are great contributors to the workforce because um, they bring a high degree of motivation, you know, ingenuity. If you think about you know just the 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 ingenuity you would need and um, the wherewithal to flee your home country, to, you know, to go to a different country. Um, that that um, and creativity that refugees bring, and so there's an organization that we work with uh, called the Tent Partnership for Refugees, and uh, they were founded by Hamdi Ulukaya, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Chobani Yogurt, who's um, Kurdish Turkish, so uh, has a uh, you know a, a soft spot in his heart for refugees, and um, their whole mission is to. Um, is to bring more corporations in to support to support refugees in general, and so we partnered with them on some specific LGBTQ refugee initiatives. But um, you know, the idea there is also to connect uh, uh, queer refugees and asylum seekers with uh, with corporations. You know, that could potentially lead to uh, to longer term employment as well. All right, we couldn't be the Jackson Center without touching on some of the legalities around some of yeah. this as well, uh, and. I have to imagine that part of meeting people where they are is also providing some level of legal support because I imagine, and again, don't really know this, but I have to imagine navigating the asylum system. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, if you're fleeing your home country, you're probably not bringing all of the things with you that you need to bring to establish your own identity and 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 your your own provenance. So, what are um, what are some of what is some of the support that you offer with regard to that? Absolutely, it's a huge need, and um, it's uh, folks who are seeking asylum um, need to understand the legal system. And so many of them arrive. We did a survey recently among some of the refugees we work with in Kenya, and I think around eighty percent of them were unaware of um, you know the various rules around uh, asylum seeking in in Kenya. And so um, educating on the legal system and how it works and what refugees and asylum seekers roles are in, in it. Um, 
preparing uh, folks for interviews because uh, with any kind of asylum seeking or um, or getting uh, refugee status is a process called refugee status determination RSD. Um, if you're you know if you're say fleeing uh, war in Syria, that's a fairly easy one to you know to prove. It's like I'm Syrian, you know, there's a war there. I, you know, I need refugee status. But if you claim uh, to be, you know, uh, a, a trans woman who was persecuted in, you know, in Honduras, you've got to establish that. Or you've got to prove why that was a, a problem or what you faced, which can be a lot, can be challenging. So helping prepare people for their interviews, uh, not only understanding what the requirements are, but preparing them for, for their interviews. Um, we launched a, a legal support program in Tijuana about a year and a half ago, and it was just doing precisely that, helping prepare people for um, for seeking asylum in the U.S., especially while they're waiting um, on the Mexico side of the border. We don't represent them. We don't have lawyers in the U.S., so we don't represent them in that part of that. But preparing them, we've also been a big part of the refugee status determination process. We were basically hired by UNHCR in Turkey to do that work a number of years ago. And uh, you know, the U.S. government is now uh, happily starting to um, to ramp up or prepare to ramp up resettlement in the U.S. Um, so the Biden administration announced a new um, resettlement cap of 125,000 people, which is, you know, almost 10 times higher than it was under the previous administration. Um, it takes a long time to ramp up the infrastructure for that. It's not like you can just... Mm -hmm on and you know people, imagine, yeah. Like, yeah and that's you know we're experiencing that now even with the relatively small numbers of afghan refugees um you know you might hear in the news that some of them are military bases and uh you know in virginia or here or in other countries uh in route to the u.s and so that's because you know the whole structure of where to resettle them and how and services to plug into them was kind of was really dismantled under the last administration it takes time to build that up so um, as the U.S. starts ramping up resettlement program, we hope to become more involved with that refugee status determination and with um, uh, recommending cases for expedited uh, resettlement. So, uh, but yeah, but a, a, a lot of that is premised on um, legal cases and, and folks um, getting the support they need in order to, to make a proper case. This is a question that just occurred to me as I was listening to you describe this. And I wonder if, I wonder what your opinion is on how challenging it. So for example, the, the trans women from Honduras that you, that you posited there, how challenging is it to gather the evidence necessary to show that she has been persecuted in her home country? And in your opinion, are some of those requirements a little too onerous or do they make sense? Just curious as to what your your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it, it is challenging. Um, occasionally, there will be, say, police reports of attacks, um, but not always. Um, I met recently a shelter we serve, we uh, partner with in Tijuana that serves LGBTQ refugees. And I met a young gay uh, Honduran, he was actually a Honduran uh, guy, and he, his brother, who was also gay, had been murdered and he had photos of him murdered and, you know, lying in a ditch, gruesome and just horrible beyond beliefs. So occasionally there, are, there is proof like that. There are photos or there are police reports, but more often than not, there isn't. And again, if um, if it's your family, you know, that was beating you, I, I know a trans, uh, young trans woman from Guatemala who was raped by her father. And then when she reported to the police was, was violated by the police as well. So yeah, it, so it can be, uh, it can be very challenging. And that's where things like the country of origin reports and um, news reports on conditions in, in countries um, are really important as well as testimonies of others you know, when occasionally there are friends or family members that will uh, provide testimonies in in uh, in their support. So it's um, it's complicated. And I understand that we have to have some sort of bar or threshold, but I think there certainly is um, room for a need for more understanding in, in those cases, in the bleeding of those cases. There was a uh, relatively early on in your history as well, a pilot resettlement program in San Francisco, I believe. Um, and is, is, my understanding of that program, and, and by all means, correct me if I'm not getting this quite correct, um, was that it was also, it was that integration support. So it was sort of the, um, the holistic view of how do we, how do we help um, not only with the, um, the, the mechanics of resettlement, but then also helping 
them to feel welcome in their new community and to, to really be able to call this home. So perhaps you do not have a situation like the African refugees mentioned that who went to Sweden and, and ended up coming back. So could you speak a little bit to that resettlement program? Is that still going on? Um, we, because our work has, uh, has almost always focused in transit countries, it was something we were involved with just a little bit more peripherally. It's, it's obviously uh, hugely important. Um, it's really something that's led more by local community-based organizations in the U.S. And that was one, yeah, where I think we were, we were connecting and feeding in with, um, with programs in the Bay Area and existing social services um, networks and you know luckily we we are blessed to have a great network of LA of LGBT centers in the US across the country many of especially in bigger cities that uh, have a dimension that um, reaches out to immigrant and, and refugee populations um, our center here in Los Angeles is huge and has a really great program a lot of those uh, facilities are better uh, designed in a way because they have a lot of those wraparound social services um, but then you know pleased to see, and including the program that you referenced from a number of years ago, um, connected with uh, re religious communities uh, or communities aff affiliated with different faith groups, um, which is great because you might think that um, that people of faith might be unwelcoming to LGBT people, but we've seen the opposite, that there are a lot of church groups and synagogues and other you know faith-based groups that are actually very welcoming of LGBT people, including, including refugees. So I think there's going to be a great, we're going to see a great need for that. Um, to be ramped up and expanded in the coming months and years. Yeah, we've talked a lot over this past year about, um, although we have been having these conversations on isolated topics, that there's really a lot of interconnectedness between the various topics. And as I think you mentioned in your intro as well, with every layer that you add, just adds a different challenge or piles, stacks up those challenges um, as well. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the uh, Kakuma refugee camp research, and ORM does a, a lot of research. You've mentioned some of the, the country of origin reports as well. I'd love to hear you talk about, I can't imagine when ORM started that that was a, a focus. And so obviously that became pretty clear that that sort of documentation or evidence would be necessary to advance ORM's mission. So would love to hear you talk about why that, how that research came to be, uh, or that arm of, of what ORAN does and, and its importance. Yeah, uh, again, 13 years ago when the organization started, really none of that existed. And uh, our founder was an attorney and, you know, a real expert in this area of the law. And, um, and so that was really kind of the, the laid the groundwork for that. And uh, we, we did a lot of that early work in partnership with UNHCR and some other groups. And um, it has served as, I think, the baseline for a lot of the work that's happened in this space. And uh, so, you know, we've uh, tried to continue that again in different ways, whether uh, and taking it in new directions as well. The country of origin reports that we were just talking about, which are so critical, we'll be starting a new one of those soon. Uh, but then more deep dives into specific geographies like the the um, the Kakuma report. And then more recently, I talked a bit about um, the tent partnership and um, our, you know, our work and new opportunities we see for advancing the economic inclusion of refugees, LGBT refugees specifically. And we were commissioned by them uh, about a year and a half ago to write a guide on corporate mentorship programs for LGBT refugees. So it's, uh, uh, and this has proved to be hugely popular. And now uh, over 20 companies have committed to, uh, to mentoring over 2000 LGBTQ refugees around the world, uh, in North America and in the UK and uh, they're now developing a new guide for Germany as well. And so, um, you know, it's another way to kind of, I think, keep the topic current and to reach different audiences with the work we do and to engage folks and to continue to uh, kind of push forward on all these fronts. You had mentioned that there were, there's more than 80 million um, uh, unsettled, uh, displaced persons uh, in the world at the moment. Thank you. And I believe a, a little over 4 million of them are asylum seekers, if I'm remembering that figure mm -hmm. correctly from the UNHCR website. Do we have a sense of how many of those are LGBTQIA? I'm sure I'm forgetting some. <laughs> Plus. <laughs> there, <but laughs> Do we have a sense? Because when you talk about they've agreed to mentor 2,000 of them, that sounds like an impressive number, but yeah. is it is it really within whatever the global universe is? It's a good question. And sadly, we don't have those numbers. Um, 
UNHCR and even the US government have to this point um, resisted collecting data on folks' sexual orientation and gender identity, which is, we believe, and I know a lot of the uh, organizations that work in this space also believe is a big mistake. Because, um, you know, there's a saying, if, uh, if you're not counted, you don't count. And, um, you know, that certainly applies. And even, you know, even within the U.S. country, within the U.S., we've, uh, we've not been included in census, uh, you know, census demographic information. And so it's really hard to establish the parameters and the needs of communities. So all that to say, we don't have hard uh, numbers, but, you know, we have estimates um, for what the, you know, the LGBTQ population is, which is probably somewhere between five and 10% globally. And, you know, um, these folks are, you know, facing heightened challenges. So the numbers could be even higher in terms of percentage of overall population. But even if it was just two or 3% um, of that total, you know, population of 4 million displaced people, that's still 80,000 or 120,000, or, you know, likely a lot more, uh, you know, LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers. And so, um, so it's a, you know, it's a large number. It's a community that's, you know, uh, at, at the intersection of so many, um, so many vulnerabilities and, and points of marginalization. So there's really just a, a huge, uh, you know, a huge need there for this community for sure. And you have uh, mentioned a number of uh, partnerships in general, that, especially with local organizations. Yep. Are, are there particular ones you would like to, you know, in, in maybe it's in Kenya or maybe it's yeah. in um, Mexico, are there particular partnerships that you, feel you know are could be used as models uh perhaps if for for other organizations or for other people who are looking to get involved in this space absolutely i'll give a shout out to a couple of the folks that we work with um in kenya and in, in there's a, a a large urban uh lgbt refugee population in nairobi and we work with a great group there called the refugee coalition of east africa um they had they established themselves several years ago before we started working with them and they are a coalition of um, about 15 even smaller what we call community-based organizations, a lot of them built around safe houses, just a, a house where a group of, you know, maybe 10 trans refugees live or, you know, a, a dozen refugees from a particular French-speaking country. And so they're, they're represented in this umbrella group called the, the Refugee Coalition of East Africa or REFSIA. And we've developed such a great partnership with them. And I'm actually going to be spending time with them um, starting next week. I'm traveling out to Kenya. And... Um, you know, again, our work, we work really in partnership, our work is based around them and, and their needs, and um, they do a lot of the implementation, you know, we do a lot of the co-creating, and um, it's just great to uh, to really be able to partner them, with them in this way. Um, in Mexico, in Tijuana, we've worked really closely for the last couple of years with um, a shelter called El Jardín de las Mariposas, which actually interestingly started, started as the first and only uh, rehab for LGBTQ people in Tijuana based on substance abuse and alcoholism issues. And uh, when uh, the, the huge migrant caravan started arriving in Tijuana and there were a lot of LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers with no place to go, they opened their doors to them. And now that's the majority of the folks that they serve. And so uh, they've been a, a great partner with us. And uh, again, uh, really building our programs with them and around them and evolving um, to serve them that, you know, that's where a lot of our legal work happens. Um, and then in terms of partners with other either US or uh, multi international NGOs, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work recently with Rainbow Railroad, which is a Canadian based uh, LGBTQ refugee organization, they focus more specifically on the piece of relocating people from one country to another. So our work is complementary in that way. We do a lot of work with immigration equality, which does, which is a big legal organization that does do more of the representing people's legal needs here in the US once they're in the US. So again, finding partnerships that are kind of complementary to us and, and the work that we do. That makes sense. That another theme as we've been talking uh, this year is certainly that no one organization is going to advance the ball all the way it needs to go um, in issues of justice. And so this really is a, a partnership effort, a team effort. It is, it takes many oars pulling in the same direction to, to try and try and get to, to try and close those those equity and justice gaps. I don't know that we'll ever get all the way there, but at least to work on narrowing yeah. what that is. You have a clear passion for this work. And I am curious as to 
Um, who inspired you? Who who brought you into this world and 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 lit some of this fire in you? Wow. Um, I you know I will say that you know I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, and um, I you know didn't realize or I guess, or maybe didn't accept that I was gay as, as a kid and um, didn't come out till my mid twenties and, you know, was really um, of course, honestly terrified about, you know, how my family was respond. I think we all on some fundamental level, you know, um, fear the loss of the love of our parents. Right. And, um, you know, I remember come, my coming out to them in my mid twenties is a really pivotal moment. And, you know, much to their credit, they were incredibly, uh, uh, empathetic and welcoming and loving and said and did all the right things and been a great support. And, you know, for all the challenges, we all face challenges from different directions and, you know, challenges and discrimination, uh, you know, I've faced as being a, a gay man. Uh, I will say, by the way, you know, I, even moving to California, which of course is, you know, supposed to be this uh, liberal hippy dippy corner of the, of the country. Uh, as recently as the late nineties, when I moved out here, my first boss, um, told me very pointedly that California was the land of the fruits and the nuts. And, you know, I need to, to watch my back a little, you know, and, uh, so, you know, they're having, you know, in spite of having faced discrimination challenges of my own, like I realized how fortunate I, um, I, I have been overall. And, it, you know, it, it, it reached me in kind of a point in my forties where I realized I had a lot to be grateful for and a, and a lot to want to give back. And um, so I started, to, you know, I recognized at the time as well that we had made so much progress in the U S in terms of uh, LGBT rights, that the biggest gaps were internationally. And so that was, that was kind of the broad entryway into this work. And then I will say more specific to like a specific person or people that have inspired me. You know, I started this work about two and a half years ago in the LGBT refugee space. And one of the first trips I made was the same trip I'm doing now to Kenya. And I met with the community and um, you know, I met this uh, young trans woman from Uganda named Vanilla. And um, the things that she had been through fleeing for her life, people trying to kill her back in Uganda, you know, not, you know, routinely facing um, people in Kenya, her, you know, the country where she lives, um, who deny her very, you know, her very existence or her actual gender identity. and um, and just the, the challenge and the trauma and the persecution that she's gone through. And yet this incredible, such a commitment to, of authenticity to being, you know, who she is. And, you know, as again, as a gay man, I could, you know, at some point, if you decide to be openly LGBT, you decide, okay, I'm going to be who I am, you know, regardless of the challenges. It's just that for some people, those challenges are so much greater. And to realize, you know, her commitment to being that, you know, rather than just being closeted and trying to, you know, live undercover back home and, you know, um, and willing to, and she's a real leader in the community. She leads one of the, the CBOs and, you know, the, the challenges she go through, goes through on a daily basis. It just constantly inspires me to put that foot forward when I get frustrated and, um, you know, reminds me why we're doing this work. So part of also why I'm really glad to be getting back there next week. Makes sense. Okay. So now we enter some of the closing series of questions. Okay. Uh, and before we get to the lightning round, there are always two questions I like to ask uh, the experts that we have in front of us. So the first is, what do you wish people were paying more attention to in this space? What isn't getting enough airtime? Yeah, honestly, um, this that's a very simple answer for me. I think it's really just the shared humanity of refugees and asylum seekers. That these are people, you know, they could be our brothers or sisters or cousins or neighbors. And um, it, you, you know, we have a tendency um, to, other eyes people and to make them this is the, the other or uh, you know a foreigner I mean we actually call um we call non-Americans aliens you know? and um it all seeks to kind of create these distances between us and I think if people can start realizing that um refugees and asylum seekers just humans oftentimes facing dire uh dire challenges. I think, honestly, that again, I mentioned this earlier, but where um, some of what's happening in Afghanistan is opening people's eyes and their hearts, you know, and we're seeing a lot, a lot of um, change attitudes based on that. You know, even in the work that we do in the LGBT space, we're hearing people say, uh, how can we support LGBT re Afghan refugees? So, uh, you know, I think that that's where progress and hope can really happen. Okay. And then what do you see as some of the biggest priorities to work towards closing those equity gaps or advancing immigration, refugee, asylum seeker justice? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I always think kind of big picture on something like that. I think continued raised awareness of what the issues are and what the challenges are, which I think will then lead to or should lead to or what we continue advocating for is additional funding to support the work that needs to happen, because a lot of it is just rolling up your sleeves and um, and doing the work. And then we also need um, broader and uh, more rapid moves on the on the part of governments, you know, to um, to implement more um, just and and welcoming uh, asylum systems. Okay. All right. Now for the lightning round. Okay. What progress do you hope to see in the next year? Gosh, there's so much uh, that needs to happen. Um, definitely borders opening back up more, you, you know, in reasonable ways. I mean, Title 42 needs to go away. It's shocking, honestly, that it's still in place. Um, number one, because the administration um, promised that it would go and it hasn't. Um, and number two, it's, you know, it's just so irrelevant now. I mean, we live in a different world uh, regarding COVID and it wasn't right in the beginning, in the first place. Um, resettlement slots increasing. I mentioned that already. Um, we have this number, this kind of official number, but the um, resettlement hasn't um, really started yet. So that needs uh, to start and really be happening in, within the next year. Um, and also, um, I talked a little bit about funding, but reprioritization of, of funding um, for LGBTQ refugee issues in general, because it's, um, again, it's an area with a great need, but with really limited resources. Okay. What gives you hope that progress will be made? Um, I would say, again, I'll come back to this point that I think there are slowly uh, some changing attitudes, uh, the, the Afghan um, situation, I think even the Haitians at the border and Americans seeing, you know, black uh, refugees and asylum seekers being chased by, you know, officers on horses and kind of corralled. I think that shocking image, um, again, has um, raised awareness and starting to hopefully change some hearts and minds. Um, that gives me a little bit of hope. And then also that we do, we do have an administration that is more um, responsive and, and open on these issues and seeing just, you know, justice on these issues. Uh, again, there's still there's still room for improvement in terms of the timing and the speed that all this is happening, but it does give me hope at least. Okay. You mentioned a number of organizations that you partner with. Are there others that you'd like to highlight who are doing good work in this space to, to drive towards closing these equity gaps? Yeah, I you know I would mention again the, the two that I mentioned before that we Railroad and immigration equality. Um, also, we have um, uh, a parent organization. They're a mainstream humanitarian refugee organization called Alight, formerly the American Refugee Committee, and they're based in uh, in Minneapolis. And they do such amazing work, and they really live by uh, their values, which include things like bravely be better and uh, start with giving and um, um, being human centered and, you know, they really walk the walk. They're almost seem like too good to be true, but, uh, but they're a great inspiration for us and they're doing the work. They, they don't work specifically on LGBT issues. Part of why they brought us into the family is because we do, but just in terms of broader refugee, uh, issues, they're an amazing organization. Okay. And the last thing is we like to leave our audience with ways they can educate themselves. So are there, uh, articles or podcasts or thinkers that you would recommend people take a look at or explore? Yeah, I will actually recommend a couple of films because uh, who doesn't like to watch a, a, a good film, right? And so there's a couple documentaries done recently on the subject of LGBTQ uh, refugees and asylum seekers. One is called Welcome to Chechnya, and some people might have heard about um the horrific uh, attacks being perpetrated by the state of uh, um, Chechnya, Russia, against LGBT people a few years ago. And so a documentarian has went in and recreated a lot of that and spoken to, to uh, people who were victims and people who were involved. It's a riveting story. And then another documentary that, um, that our work was actually featured in called Unsettled, which focuses on the lives of four resettled LGBTQ refugees in the Bay Area. And um, it really gets, does a great job of looking at why they left, um, you know, the, the challenges of getting refugee status and getting resettled, but then also the challenges that they face once they're in the U.S. Because it's not, again, we were talking about that earlier, but it's not like it's all over when someone reaches the U.S. So um, another great film, Unsettled and Welcome to Chechnya. Thank you very much.
All right. So thank you to our audience for joining us for tea today. If you are in the United States, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving since that is coming up and join us in December when we will be previewing our 2022 program theme, which will be democracy on trial. So next year, our focus will shift more towards the government institutions, uh, both in the United States and around the world and the pressures on democracy and who is working on those and hopefully answer all of your burning questions. Um, so Steve, uh, as the executive director of ORAM, thank you very much for joining me for tea today. I appreciate it. Um, we know that um, the work continues. We all have so much more to learn and to do and really appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, great to be here. Thanks again for the invite, Kristen.